Good morning, everyone. And again, for those of you who've stayed, a special welcome to everyone on campus who's here for Friends and Family Weekend. And we're so pleased to have you visiting. So I really want to thank you today for joining Kenner, the Kenner Lecture, a conversation with Ambassador of Costa Rica, Elaine White. Today's lecture marks the opening of the Albright Institute's programming this year, which will focus on negotiating humanity, a theme Ambassador White will explore today, and in fact, the nature of much of the Ambassador's decades-long work. This year's Kenner Lecture also marks the launch of the Institute's 15th anniversary, and it's our opportunity to welcome the 15th cohort of Albright Fellows who are here with us today. Including this in, in this year's cohort, um, six, including this year's cohort, 600 Wellesley graduates have shared the transformative experience of being Albright Fellows. And I know that in the years to come, we'll be hearing from these remarkable alumni. Just an astonishing legacy. And I do think that the individual fellows themselves are among our greatest ambassadors, ambassadors for Secretary Albright's legacy. In their lives and in their careers, they pursue the peace, equity, and democratic ideals that the Secretary both cherished and fought so hard to protect and advance across the globe. In a very real sense, the important work of the Institute of the last 15 years has been fueled by the Secretary's life service, her diplomatic achievements, principles, her empathy, her hopes for humanity, and her belief in the arc of progress. With each cohort, our debt to the Secretary grows, just as the long shadow of her impact and influence lengthens as well. I'm certain that today's discussion will be engaging. It will be an engaging conversation and a testament to another successful year of Albright Institute's programs and events. I'd like to begin by thanking those who make today's conference possible. I want to say a special thank you, of course, to Ambassador White, and it's uh, really an honor to host her and, our distinguished, and to have her be our distinguished guest, and to our own Associate Provost for Wellesley in the World and Professor of Political Science, Stacy Goddard, who, who will facilitate today's discussion. And a great thanks to our hardworking Albright Institute team, including Program Director Nina McKee, herself an Albright Fellow alumna, Special Projects Coordinator Julie Lanza, and Assistant Director of Academic Conferences, Beth Robichaud. The planning and preparation made, uh, have made today possible. And we're grateful for all that you do for our Albright Fellows and for the larger Wellesley community. And lastly, I'd like to thank Hunja Laskin Tenor Kenner, Class of 88, and Jeffrey Kenner for establishing the endowed fund that supports the Kenner Lecture Series and enables us to put on events like today's. So as we look around the world today, the idea at the heart of today's conversation, negotiating for humanity, is an urgent call for the peacemakers, bridge builders, and citizen leaders the world needs. At Wellesley and at the Albright Institute, we're working hard to answer that call, which makes today's lecture all the more relevant and all the more crucial. Ambassador White has argued that 21st century international policy responses must transcend the interests and capabilities of individual or groups of states to protect the global commons, generate global public goods, and address humanity's challenges. I'd argue that this proposition is based on the same hope and the same democratic values that Secretary Albright stood for and put into practice. This, despite, or perhaps we should say because of, her experiences as a refugee from Czechoslovakia 
and as a member of a family who fled the Nazis in 1938 and then the communists in 1948, she had an intimate understanding of the darkest political movements of the modern world. Up through her final months, she was writing and speaking about however she could about the threat and sadly, the resurgence of these types of regimes. But in spite of this grave threat, she was hopeful and never stopped believing in democracy and in the power of diplomacy and, as Amb Ambassador White reminds us, in the need to center our policy in pursuit of the common good. So as we think about our deep divisions and profound issues that we face, I know we'll explore some of these to in today's conversation. I would ask that we also reflect on the Secretary's spirit and courage, that we take what we learned today and use it to take action for the common good and to promote peace for all. There's no, no more of a fitting way that I can think of to honor Secretary Albright. So with that, it's my privilege to introduce Ambassador Elaine White, a respected diplomat, foreign policy expert, and academic with over 25 years of experience. Ambassador White has advanced international agreements and other diplomatic frameworks on issues ranging from human rights, global health, sustainable development, nuclear disarmament, and international security. In this work, she has honed skills in policy making, diplomacy, international cooperation, negotiation, and governance. From 2014 to 2020, she served as ambassador and permanent representative of Costa Rica to the United, uh, United Nations in Geneva during which time she had contributed in a number of areas. For example, in 2017, Ambassador White presided over the United Nations Conference that negotiated and adopted the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons on a mandate from the General Assembly. From 2015 to 2018, she led the negotiations for global cooperation, for a global cooperation framework at the World Health Organization that aimed to tackle the neglected problem of snake bite evonoming, a framework that the World Health Assembly uh, adopted. As a policy leader, she has served as the executive director of Meso America Integration and Development, which connects 10 nations with the goal of promoting economic development, as well as heading the Central American Security Commission and the Central American Executive Committee. In addition to currently serving as professor of the practice at the Johns Hopkins School, University School of Advanced International Studies, she has pursued research as a 2022 fellow at Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative, and this past year was a fellow at Harvard's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Ambassador White will be joined by Stacy Goddard, the Betty Fryerhoff Johnson, class of 44, professor of political science, and the inaugural associate provost for Wellesley in the world. So I am so grateful that Ambassador White is with us today to share her invaluable insight, and I'm so looking forward to her conversation with Professor Stacy Goddard. So now please join me in welcoming Ambassador and Professor Goddard to the stage. Thank you so much, President Johnson, for that introduction. Um, I also want to take a few moments thanking uh, the Albright staff who organized all of this today, the Albright Fellows, who I'm sure you are all out there, and especially um, to the family uh, of, of all the students who are here today. Um, it's really the students that make this institution the place uh, that it is, and we're just so happy to have you on campus. And obviously, my biggest thank you goes to Ambassador Elaine White, who has joined us here today. Um, we have 45 minutes, and I think I have six hours of material, so we should probably get going. Um, President Johnson mentioned that this is the kickoff 
um, to Albright's year, and the theme is negotiating for humanity. Um, this is a theme that very much reflects your career. Um, it is also a theme that uh, was shamelessly stolen from a class that you teach, um, so full disclosure there. I'm wondering if you could say a bit about what you mean when you say negotiating for humanity. How are we supposed to think about that is somehow different than normal approaches to diplomacy? Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. President Johnson, what a wonderful uh, introduction of myself. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really am privileged to be here with all of you uh, today. And thank you, Stacy, uh, Vice Provost for Wesley and the World, uh, for this opportunity. I really, I really um, am looking forward to this conversation. So after serving several years uh, at the UN, uh, negotiating different topics, I was left obviously with many uh, concerns, questions, and one of them was that um, if we look at history, nations, and before that, uh, sovereigns, individual sovereigns, um, have been negotiating not only for centuries, but for millennia. And quite interestingly, if we really look at history, we realize that the, the topics of the negotiations are, were very similar to the interstate system. So they were negotiating on mm, territorial claims, mm, security arrangements, alliances, trade. Very similar to what we have in the interstate system. In the 18th century, late uh, part of the 18th and 19th century, the international system discovered that it was already time to start negotiating on international organizations to cover things that were very important for the international relations of the moment, like uh, setting in order the service of telegraph. So the International Telecommunications Union, back then it was the International Telegraph Union, was established the World Meteorological Organization was established. And uh, so that was the birth of the international, of international, functional international cooperation. And in the 20th century, that international cooperation was expanded to all the topics that we can imagine, health and education and women's rights and, and uh, science and so on and so forth. But in the 21st century, because of the level of interconnectedness and interdependence that the human society has been able to build, and because of the capacity of human activity to actually have an impact on the natural environment, we are starting to see a different kind of challenges and problems that are universal, that cannot be addressed or solved by any one nation, that has an impact, that have an impact on humanity as a whole. There are problems of people and planet rather than problems of states. And also that affect, that, that don't only have transboundary effects, but they also if affect humanity as a whole, but current and future generations alike. So there is a lot of intergenerational justice in these problems climate change, migration, the erosion of the planet's biocapacity, the loss of biodiversity, the risk posed by nuclear weapons, and we can continue on talking about these universal challenges that do, do challenge the common wisdom with which we normally approach international negotiations, which is that we are going to negotiate for problems of the state. And that the instruments that we agree upon mostly are based on creating national measures in the hope that the sum of national measures that the countries undertake to solve one problem is going to create a global change. But in this case, national measures are not enough. 
And if we want to, to create a, uh, to illustrate, to use a case to illustrate, let us use the example of, of plastic pollution. Scientists tell, tells us that in some 20 or 30 years, there is, there are going, there's going to be more plastic than fish in the ocean. Um, and the, there are current negotiations going on in order to address this problem of, of plastic, plastic pollution. And many, many delegations are, are based on the Paris agreements. There's, they are saying we should approach these negotiations to have an outcome by which countries establish national commitments, just like the national determined contributions of, of climate change. And that is important to, to somewhat diminish or, yes, decrease the level of consumption of plastic. But what about the plastic that is already out there in the ocean? How do we clean it? Mm -hmm. Especially when, when this um, pollution is going to be in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So we need a different kind of structure that together with national measures is going to provide some public services, goods and services for humanity, just like the goods and services that we have, and that function so well that we don't, we don't have awareness that um, they exist. Let me cite an example. Mm, civil aviation. Um, on telecommunications, when was the last time that we uh, called somebody on the phone or by WhatsApp or connected via Zoom with somebody very far away abroad? But that is possible because there is an agreement that binds together all the countries of the world that arrange and distribute the radio uh, spectrum system of, of, the, of the planet civil aviation, or the Universal Postal Union. When was the last time that we received a mail from a country very distant? So back in the uh, 19th century, there was an organization that, that uh, systematized and arranged the service of, of, of posting and mailing. But it functioned so well that we don't realize same thing with peace, global peace. We haven't had a, a, a global conflict for seven decades. We, of course, have had conflicts, but not a global conflict. But we don't realize how we are benefiting from those good global goods and services um, and how they constitute the basis of our society. So we have global challenges, universal challenges and problems that affect all of us, at the same time that we have the responsibility to take care of these global commons. So what you're saying is almost commonsensical, right? These, these, are, these are global problems. They are collective challenges. They require collective action. Like no, no one state can do it on its own. And you're absolutely right, too, that there are all these areas in which there's cooperation that is, it's, it's going so well, it's seamless. You, you, you don't even think about it. And then we have problems, problems that you have worked on, right? Problems of climate change, uh, problems of nuclear nonproliferation, um, problems of managing public health. That seems so very intractable, and it seems so very difficult to get states to work together in, in, in collective action. What is it about some of these problems that makes them so intractable? And, and, and how do you begin to think about using diplomacy to kind of build that ground for collective action? I think they are very difficult for several different reasons. One of them is the time scale that we need to actually generate impact. And the time scale usually uh, goes beyond one generation and specifically goes beyond, especially in democratic system, goes beyond the natural term of each government. So the administrations would tend to, to have a, a, a shorter term view, especially in dealing with the next, with the following election, electoral process. Electoral processes and the, the natural change of government actually is short term, whereas the, the actions that need to be taken are long term. So the time scale is, is obviously a, a one that is very important. I, I 
go very frequently, we are talking about, for instance, climate change. So we are now having a global conversation about the, uh, around the Paris Agreement um, to curve uh, the, the emissions. But in reality, that conversation started in 1972, when the Swedish government thought that there was a link between development and the environment, and proposed the United Nations to hold a conference to address the issue of environment and development, and that took place in Stockholm in 1972. That conference created the United Nations Development Program, and at the same time, they created the, the, the global, the, the panel of scientists, the um, inter intergovernmental panel on, on climate change that has been documented, documenting the scientific evidence. And they, they um, gathered enough evidence, so when we went to Rio in 1992, the international community created the Convention on Climate Change. And it took 23 years from Rio to Paris. So that gives us an idea of how long it takes to see change and, and um, at the same time, we have to say, well, now we are in the 21st century. We already know, we have learned um, some pathways that we have followed. We create uh, a space to understand the problem, then we create structures to uh, help us deal with the problem, and then we evolve until we go, we, are, we reach a global target, for instance, to cut the emissions by 40%. How can we, in the 21st century, cut that time scale? Because based on, on the lessons that we have learned. So the issue of time scale is, is absolutely important. The other aspect why this is very difficult is the mindsets and the paradigms with which we negotiate. Um, the paradigms of international negotiations are very uh, influenced by the realist approach of international relations that uh, sees national interest in a more narrow sense in terms of viewing the national interest in terms of security and economic well-being, and mostly defining national interest vis-a-vis -vis competing with the national interest of other national states. But in the 21st century, we know that um, it is in the national interest of all society to be sustainable and to, and to have a planet that is sustainable for the future generations. So there is a need to mm, recalibrate how we build national interest in a more comprehensive manner that not only includes the traditional, the traditional concerns of sovereignty, security, and economic well-being, but that also includes the the, the problems of people and, and, and planet and how people, problems of people and planet impact national interest. Then we have the, the, the problem of, as I mentioned before, the, of jurisdiction. Because we have this mindset that uh, we can approach international problems by agreeing on national measures. And we need uh, to think beyond this approach and being innovative and being innovative and creating new mechanisms. And I would say the last problem, not in the finances, there are many other uh, challenges, but the last one is the lack of awareness that we have of how our everyday normal life depends on global public goods. We just don't realize. We are not aware. So there is a gap, an awareness gap, in, in also in diplomats and, and in the way in which we frame international negotiations and for humanity. No, that, that kind of repeating theme of when things are not visible, it's hard to realize how Im important they are, right? And one thing you're pointing to is, thinking about the 21st century, an acceleration in global challenges that need global collective action. And again, climate change, um, issues of nuclear nonproliferation. Um, that seems, however, to be running up against an unfortunate other trend. Um, which is a reassertion of national interest, um, a resurgence of issues of international security, 
um, and an increase in the use of violence as opposed to using diplomacy, whether or not we're talking about Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Gaza. How is it, given the importance of this collective action, that we can find rules, room for diplomacy in this? And are you worried that once again these, these, these norms are, are breaking down in the 21st century when we really need them the most? So indeed, this is the great dilemma of this generation. And I like to think about these historic trends also in terms of how each generation needs to cope with one single problem. We usually we're not able to cope with many at the same time, except for the generation of the interwar periods, because they had to create responses to avoid the recurrence of uh, world wars and the Great Depression. So they created um, United Nations and they created an international financial system and also a trade system to, to avoid what they had to endure in one generation. Great, oh no, I forgot, uh, I forgot uh, the pandemic. So one generation endured a global pandemic, it endured two wars and, and a Great Depression. And they were able to completely um, innovate and create something unprecedented at the time. So global breakdown of diplomacy. First of all, this is very interesting, Stacy, because now we have the view that diplomacy is like the antithesis of war. There was a time in history in which diplomacy used to go to war because diplomats were there in the battlefield and after, after the wars and the battles, they would sign agreements that would consolidate the new status quo created by the war. It was after the, the actually after 1932 and then the, the creation of, of the UN that, that the, I think the whole planet uh, has this view that diplomacy is the is this the peaceful solution of um, of conflict? But in reality, diplomacy has an instrumental role in foreign policy of states. So it is subordinate to the foreign policy of the states. And in thinking about that. I don't necessarily see a breakdown of diplomacy, but I see that I like to think in these times as an expression of system entropy. So systems from time to time tend to fall into this array and somewhat the, the, this equilibrium and when that happens, there is less energy in the system to cope with the regular tasks. Mm -hmm. And at some point, then the systems would rearrange and would seek equilibrium again. I think this we're going through a, a period of entropy. The great question is, what is the, the new equilibrium that is going to be shaped after this? How is it going to look like? And, and what we're going to do with all the norms and institutions that actually have served us well for seven decades? Are we going to throw them as, um, out of the window? Or are we going to be able to build a new version of the system based on the legacy of what has worked well? This, the, the norms, the prohibition of the use of force, the respect of, of human rights, the respect of, um, of, the, of the rules of, of war, because even wars have rules. Um, how we are going to be able to rebuild a new equilibrium of the system that doesn't throw away the great legacy of the previous generations. And that is, that is the great dilemma, and I think that is what we have to be mindful of and to keep our, our focus on, on a discussion that rescues the, these fundamental principles that understands that even at a moment of disorder to be able to recognize the foundations that have been laid down and to bring those into the new equilibrium, so to speak. Even in some, in some cases that gives you a little bit of hope because even with, when states are 
behaving in a way that seems very distant from the norm. Right. At the same time, there are many states, maybe third parties, that are recalling the principles of the UN Charter, that are recalling the principles of international humanitarian law and the obligations of international humanitarian law. So despite the fact that, uh, that um, state behavior is not necessarily at this moment complying with the norms, there are other voices that are bringing the, the norms to the conversation. And, and, and that, to me, actually raises the question of, of, of various actors ca that can push towards this normative equilibrium, right? Because as you're, as you're talking and, you know, have this, I think, very, very grounded optimism um, about the return to equilibrium, you know, another thing I think about is it could be worse. And, and, and in particular, you know, thinking about increased competition between the United States China and Russia, it states that you really do need at the table on all of these collective problems that seem more inclined to being in conflict. And it makes me wonder how it is that other actors, you know, including you're the diplomatic representative of Costa Rica, how do all of these other actors come together to push the system towards equilibrium when so many of these other very large actors seem to be pushing more towards disorder? So this is very interesting because there are many actors that don't, that cannot, or are not engaged in the power competition. And those actors that are not engaged in this power competition um, see what is going on with great concern, and we are able to build coalitions and to build narratives that actually uh, call on the, the overall international system and the great powers to follow the path of common humanity, to follow the path of common rules that we have, that we have um, achieved. And at the same time, this is where we need to bring on board the role of what I call the global diplomats. The global diplomats are the, the civil society organizations, transnational networks of civil society organizations, scientists that are engaged in diplomacy, but they don't represent an, an, a nation state. They represent a topic, an aspiration, and they, what they do is they help the international community um, in, in you know, setting up the agenda, but, in, in, but also help us to help the governments to move towards more aspirational goals and um, the interest of humanity. So, this topic of global diplomats, including civil society, including scientists, that actually brings me to, to a topic I really wanted to focus on, which is your work on issues of nonproliferation, nuclear nonproliferation. Um, you were chair of the negotiations that led to the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons, um, created in 2017 um, and ratified in 2021. Yes. Um, just so everybody has the background here, could you say a bit about what is in this treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons and why it's significant? Thank you very much for that question. Um, let me first of all say that um, uh, you said that I, that I have worked on issues of non-proliferation. And this is very, very interesting because after the Cuban Missile Crisis, especially the U.S. And, and, and President Kennedy and Soviet Union, they were concerned about the, the potential spread and dissemination of, of, uh, of nuclear capa uh, capabilities. And they had information that around 25 nations at the time um, had uh, nuclear weapons programs that could develop, uh, or they had nuclear programs that could develop nuclear weapons. So they decided to propose to the rest of the international community the non-proliferation, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Um, in the original proposal, there was a text that was drafted by them, by Soviet, the, the Soviet Union and the U.S., and they, and they, proposed, um, they proposed it to the rest of the international community to uh, propose the, the rest of the countries to, to give up the possibility of, of um, being nuclear weapon states or being nuclear, possessing nuclear weapons, um, in exchange for the, uh, to having access to the technology, nuclear technology for peaceful uses. 
And the rest of the world said they, they did take that offer, but with one condition. There was the trade-off in the negotiation. Um, that the nuclear weapon states committed to disarmament. That was included in Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the fact that after the, the, the Reagan-Gorbachev uh, agreement and, and arms control agreements that um, saw, that, that allowed the international community to see a drast, uh, drastic reduction in the nuclear arsenals, the, the, that legal commitment did not follow through. Uh, and um, quite the opposite now, we are seeing the complete, the complete uh, opposite trend. The, all the nuclear states are modernizing their arsenals, they're creating more sophisticated mm, um, technology there that uh, is altering even the time of delivery of the, of the nuclear weapon and, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is a, an introduction to say that the rest of the international community has never legitimized the existence of nuclear weapons in the existence of nuclear deterrence. And the call for the prohibition, the legal prohibition of nuclear weapons actually started in 1946. Uh, actually, the, the day after the, 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 the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the following year by the International Committee um, of the Red Cross, and actually the first ever meeting of the United Nations, first ever General Assembly. The charter was negotiated in 45. The first meeting was in January, only six months after the, the uh, Nuclear, uh, detonations in, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. First ever decision by the United Nations General Assembly was Resolution 1, precisely to call for the abolition of nuclear weapons from national arsenals. From there on, there has been permanent contestation to the nuclear order by the, by the rest of the international community, but as my colleague from, from Austria very rightly points out, this contestation is, it doesn't leave the corridors of, of international fora and the UN. We don't realize it's not exposed in the media, hmm? that there is this, this permanent contestation of the nuclear order. And so the treaty that prohibits nuclear weapons feels, first of all, a historic call by the international community to have nuclear weapons, the most dangerous weapons that ever have been invented by humankind to have a legal prohibition in international law, just as the other weapons of mass destruction um, have in international law. The specific uh, treaties and norms that specifically, specifically prohibits them and abolishes them. By establishing a very uh, clear prohibition of um, a set of activities that are being associated with the, exist with the life cycle of nuclear weapons, whether testing, production, manufacturing, stationing, um, transfer of nuclear weapons. What the treaty does is, first of all, to reinforce in 2017 the principles of, of, of disarmament. It also recalls the nuclear weapon states their legal obligation to disarmament in Article, in Article 6. And also, it is a vehicle to tell the world that there is no acceptance of nuclear deterrence and nuclear weapons in the international community. Even if this um, non-acceptance and contestation is not, is not, it doesn't transpire in, in the public discussion after, um, after the UN uh, corridors. And then it also helps us to reframe the conversation about nuclear weapons away from the consideration of state, um, abstract notions of state security, to considering the scientific evidence of what in reality happens when there is a nuclear detonation. What happens to the environment? What happens to people? So this is a treaty that has, that has been able to consolidate a, 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 a paradigm of security based on human security and on security for the, for the planet itself and for all, because nuclear deterrence, it's a club. 
and it is a club that that uh, that um, claims that they are secure because of of the nuclear threat, whereas the whole of humanity is not secure. Right. Once again, in what you were saying, I, I was struck by the idea that you said so much of this has been contained to the forums of the UN, that in, in many ways, nuclear politics isn't really visible to many of us, this type of nuclear contestation. Um, it was during the Cold War, but now it kind of runs just out of, out of, out of sight. Civil society was so important in pushing for the treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. And again, whether or not it was um, activist organizations, scientific organizations. Can you talk a bit about the role there as well as the potential role to make these issues visible? Because it seems to me if they're not visible, right, there's not going to be much movement on them. Let me first address the very strategic role of civil society and and individual persons. I will first talk about the survivors. The survivors of nuclear explosions and the survivors of nuclear testing around the world, in Asia and the Pacific and Africa and in Central Europe. They are the living testament of what we read in books of what the impact is of a nuclear detonation. They can tell you because they have suffered. You can see their wounds and they can tell you um, the, the real human impact. And they have shown this, what I call strategic perseverance. They, for seven decades, they have not stopped telling the stories. And they help bring reality to the discussion in terms of the need to consider that in the 21st century we have enough information and scientific information to uh, be able to build policies not in the abstract but also in consideration of the scientific evidence of the impact. And another very important consideration is that human beings, we human beings, we cannot be considered collateral damage. Of, of military operations. So they were fundamental, the survivors, and having the survivors in the room, in the negotiation room, was a permanent the recall for us, for um, the negotiators, um, to leave nonsense behind. Because in negotiations also there is a lot of egos and things of that sort. So we could, we could not fail them. We could not fail them because they were in front of us. We could see them in their eyes. Civil society organizations and scientists, absolutely. And the other question is how to, they're part of the question. I have been thinking about this a lot. And let me tell you why. So yesterday I was flying, when I was flying here in my, in, in my seat on the, on the plane, there was this screen that had this, uh, this announcement of how you could make this flight more sustainable for the planet. Then I, when I uh, order things from Whole Foods, for instance, everything comes with these huge labels that say, this is, uh, please recycle, or this is made of recyclable material, or how did we get there from 72 when the first conference of uh, addressed the impact of, of um, human activity on the environment? I think because people started to feel that that was a reality, uh, because human beings, that's how we are. We, we also learn by experiencing. And once we experience climate change, then we realize that climate change is not an abstract thing that is in books. It's real. How can we bring the reality of the risk of a nuclear detonation to the center, to the mind of, of, every, single, uh, of every single person in this living in, the, on, in, in this generation by including also the private sector, because that's what happened at some point. Why are companies all of a sudden, oh, I don't know if you saw some weeks ago, it was a very interesting video by, uh, by Apple, 
that presented, they presented their, I'm not doing um, promotion for them, but they presented the, their sustainability report to Mother, Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. And again, I said, how did we get here to have one of the most important companies of the world? Having the CEO of the mo one of the most important companies of the world talking to Mother Earth. Um, it was by creating human um, citizen awareness and incorporating also the, the business sector. And I think that is something that we need to do and also in academia and civil society just to remind everybody that the risk of a nuclear detonation is today as high as it was in the peak of the Cold War and even more dangerous. One thing that struck me in what you were saying that was, it was particularly moving when you were talking about the role of having the survivors there and that feeling that you can't let them down and in some ways thinking about that the way in which all of us need to understand we, we can't let them down and, and, and to me what that reminds me of is the importance of something that Secretary Albright always talked about in diplomacy which is empathy and the ability to actually be able to, to feel and experience what others are feeling outside of yourself and to connect with that. Um, she always talked about empathy, as, 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 as hard nosed as we think what diplomacy is, that that was actually the secret to successful diplomacy. And, and so I'm curious to hear you speak about what role empathy has played. I think you've already have in talking about nuclear weapons, but just kind of build on that a bit more. It would be very, very nice to, to have been able to, to ask Secretary Albright what she thought about technology and telecommunications because there are many people today there are say, oh, you know, diplomacy costs so much. You have to have people traveling from one place to the other and, and having all these people meet and having cups of uh, glasses of wine and so on and so forth, right? Um, first thing is that war costs even more, right? And the other, the other thing is that nothing ever substitutes the human experience. Nothing ever substitutes the, the possibility of looking at somebody in, the, in his or her eyes, feeling that other person's energy and presence. Um, and I think that has not been given enough consideration in theory and academia, the role of, of, of human contact and human interaction uh, overall. I cannot stress it enough how different, let me tell you, when did I start to think about humanity? After I spent five and a half years living every day, sharing every day with people from all corners of the world and seeing how everybody looks around the world and how they speak and what they eat. And so you understand, the common, I mean, you, you share, you, you build this sense of shared humanity. And then you also are able to acknowledge, to recognize good in all faces, religions, beliefs, and also bad and evil. And evil doesn't have a specific shape or color or anything. So you are able to establish uh, those uh, those human interactions that allow you to, to think. You look at the, at the globe in a completely different manner when you're able to share with people that despite they eat differently or they dress differently, they are human beings with exactly the same needs, aspirations, problems, sufferings, everything. Um, and that really bring, bring us together. So I think we have time for one more question. And, you know, as you're talking about being a diplomat, I, I am guessing that there are many of our students out here who could imagine themselves perhaps one day in your position. Um, not only are you a diplomat, you are also just a person, a woman of firsts, right? Um, so when you became uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica, you were the first woman in that position. You were the first person of African descent in that position. Can you maybe, in conclusion, share a little bit with our, with, with our students everyone in the room, what do they need to know to have the type of resilience and optimism to, to, to be able to move into that position? That is a complex uh, 
question because I would have a simple and also complex answer. The simple question would be focus on knowledge because knowledge is power. So that is one, that is one aspect. But then I also say another one that is, I would say it's very important. Be authentic and be yourself because there is, all, there is not, in today's world, there is not one way of being a leader. The way of being a leader is being your authentic self. There is no roles that you can feel because everybody is different and you have to bring your own reality to, um, to, to your workspace. So knowledge, authenticity, I think that this generation of, of women leaders will face a completely different set of challenges than the one that we, the ones that I faced and the ones that women before me faced. Um, but something that was very real for many of us was that in positions of, of power, power and authority didn't come with a position. We have to earn it, to earn them. And that implied working more and showing them the rest that we could be as good or even better by working more and better. And I think that that is, should not be the case anymore. We already showed, we already demonstrated, not only that we, ha we have the right, and there's nothing else to demonstrate. We have the knowledge, we have the capacities. So I think we should address leadership and all the responsibilities that come with leadership with a more, um, a, a sense of equality, a better sense of equality that actually even implies dressing up in dresses. <laughs> there was a point in my, in my career in which I really hated suits. I don't hate them anymore, but there was a point in which I really hated them, but I love dresses. And, and, and that should be you know, the way you, you wear your hair. I, um, my hair is uh, relaxed now, but I also can wear curls and feel as confident because, because there is a respect and there should be a respect for every person, for, for the human dignity and, and in respect and recognition of the characteristics of every person, of every uh, ethnic group, of any race, and, uh, and, and gender as well. I love this idea that we can finally present ourselves um, to, to be authentic, to sit up here and talk about global challenges and nuclear weapons in two very fine dresses. So, um, <laughs> we are at time. I would really appreciate it if you could join me and express our gratitude for, to Ambassador Elaine White. Thank you so much for this time. That concludes our Kenner Dialogue for today. Thank you once again all for being here. I wish I was sending you out into better weather, but that's all I can do, so thank you very much. <laughs>